This presentation is called The Limits of Hamilton's Rule. This is a fun presentation. So Hamilton's Rule, as you'll recall, is that altruism can become cooperation and selfishness can be transformed into spite when R times B is greater than C. But Hamilton's rule has two limits to it. It seems at first that this is the answer to all of the problems of social life, uh, simply to live with relatives. But that turns out to not be the case. There certainly is selection for living with relatives, but there's also limits to this. And the first one we're going to talk about is the outer limit of Hamilton's rule. I think I'm the only one who calls it that. Um, but it's really easy to see that relatedness declines exponentially. And this is simply because relatedness falls off 50% uh, at each step out that we take from ourselves to other relatives. And this is called exponential decay. And we can see that uh, relatedness indeed uh, falls off quickly. Uh, we go from 1.0, which is our relatedness to ourself, to 0.5, which is our relatedness to our child, to 0.25, our relatedness to a niece or nephew, and uh, 0.125, 12.5%, our relatedness to a first cousin. And then it keeps just getting halved at each step away from us. And very quickly, we're close to zero, it's an asymptote, so exponential decay will never actually touch zero, but it gets so close to zero that it might as well be zero, and then we can start talking about non-kin sociality. So here we can see this maybe a little better than that uh, PowerPoint chart, which isn't terribly accurate. Uh, we go from a half in our relatedness to a quarter to an eighth, to a sixteenth, to a thirty-second, to a sixty-fourth, to one twenty-eighth, to one two-fifty-sixth, to one five-twelfth. We've done this before, and if you go ten removes out, you're at one one thousand twenty-fourth of relatedness. That's close enough to zero to be zero. So why does low relatedness matter? Well, remember that what Hamilton's rule is about is how relatedness contributes to the measurement of the cost and benefits of actions. And the example that we've been using through all of this has been trading off children against nieces and nephews. Well, that's pretty easy to do because you only need the benefit to be twice the cost. Two nieces have the same probability combined of sharing a gene with you that's identical by descent as does one daughter. And that makes the whole thing quite plausible. The benefit need only be two times greater than the cost. But what about when we look at our first cousins? Well, there the relatedness is one-eighth. So one child is still one-half. And that means it takes four cousins to equal one child in terms of the probability of sharing a gene with you. And that means the benefit has to be four times greater than the cost. Well, then we go out yet further to second cousins. And by the time we get to a second cousin, uh, we're down to one thirty-second of relatedness. A child is one half. And this means it takes 16 second cousins to have the same likelihood of sharing a gene that's identical by descent with you as your one child. And you start thinking about this, the benefit now has to be 16 times greater than the cost. What's the likelihood that you're going to forego having a child and manage to spread yourself around enough to allow 16 more second cousins uh, to survive? and break even on that. And when we get out there to third cousins, it's 1 1 28th. And that means that it's going to take 64 third cousins uh, to have the same likelihood of sharing that gene with you as your one child. And by now we might as well be talking about non-kin.
we're getting close to zero, the benefit has to be 64 times greater than the cost. And we didn't use this as an example because those, those examples seem kind of implausible. So what do we see uh, in terms of the studies by primatologists of kin recognition in primates? And what they have mostly found is that nepotistic behavior that favors relatives seems to fade beyond that first cousin level. So we can call that the limit of kin recognition in primates. Humans do a little better than that. We're a little better at sorting out our distant kin. But we can conclude that Hamilton's rule is mostly about cooperation among close kin. On the one hand, we have direct fitness, which are those parent-offspring ties, which are always going to be very powerful. But when we're talking about indirect fitness, a lot of the time we're going to be talking about aunts and uncles and nieces and cousins and nephews uh, who stay within that range from a quarter to an eighth. And it gets much more dicey to start talking about benefits to distant kin. So that's the outer limit. Uh, then we can talk about the inner limits of Hamilton's rule, and I think that there's two of these. So as relatedness rises in a group, does competition subside? And the answer given by Richard Alexander back in 1973, uh, when he was writing on this, was no. And since that time, the argument is that as relatedness rises, you'll get a reduction in competition only if a special circumstance exists. And that is that resources have to be too plentiful for differential benefits to accrue. So if you take a group of kin and you stick them in a situation of unlimited resources, then of course uh, cooperation is going to be quite easy and altruism is going to flow. And that's because there's nothing to argue about. So again, we have this question, does relatedness equal amity? Well, uh, biologists who study the behavior of birds and other uh, living things argue, no, it doesn't. And birds are so interesting because they nest and they invest in their nest and in their offspring in that nest. And so students of the behavior of birds uh, answer this question, no, that family life is not, in fact, uh, all about amity. And in the words of Douglas Mock, uh, this is his book to the right, which I highly recommend. It's called More Than Kin and Less Than Kind, The Evolution of Family Conflict. Uh, why do we end up fighting with our families? Well, the answer is that there's resource competition. There may be not enough to go around. So one outcome of this is, of course, sibling rivalry. And we're going to come back and talk about this more later in another presentation. But anybody who has siblings is probably aware that if you're at all close to the same age, uh, things are not necessarily peaceful in your house. A technical term that biologists apply to this is viscosity. So viscosity is inbreeding and relatedness increasing, and it results from staying in your natal group rather than dispersing at adulthood. And the general idea here is that as viscosity rises and inbreeding increases, you can get a couple of negative effects. One of these is called inbreeding depression. And that's just the observation across quite a number of species that as inbreeding rises, fertility falls. And that's called inbreeding depression. Reproductive success starts to decline. And that puts a limit on how viscous uh, populations can become. But we can also look at this from the perspective of inclusive fitness, uh, not just in terms of inbreeding, and we can note that rising levels of relatedness will increase competition among kin. And I coined the term here, inclusive fitness depression. And Darwin's forgotten rule here is that it should be remembered that the competition will generally be most severe between those forms of life which are most nearly related to each other.
that uh, much of what Darwin was talking about was the competition among individuals in the same family. So because of that, we shouldn't be surprised by the observation of primatologists that social life among primates isn't just about kin hanging out together, but it often involves non-kin. And here's a conclusion to a recent uh, collection of work on kinship behavior in primates. And the authors write that although gains in inclusive fitness may be maximized by cooperating with close kin, gains in personal fitness are maximized by cooperating with the most competent partners, regardless of their degree of kinship. And because that personal fitness is so much stronger uh, when you're having offspring, you get those 0.5 units of fitness with each offspring, that that's never going to become inconsequential. So if you're interested, there's a nice collection of readings in a book called Kinship Behavior in Primates, and that's from page 379. So humans are primates as well. And that means that we should expect human societies to also be a mix of kin and non-kin, even small societies. So how do we achieve cooperation between non-kin? Well, we're going to come back to that in a different module. For now, we're going to go back to this question of why do kin fight with one another as well as cooperate? Thank you for listening.